This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Ashley Eckstein, Ahsoka Tano from Star Wars The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi, show number 369. We are your spoiler-free place for Star Wars discussion, analysis, and rhetoric. It's a bonus show this week as we already released an episode of Coffee with Kenobi. Chapter 10 of The Mandalorian was reviewed, The Passenger, but I've got an amazing conversation with you with Star Wars legend Kyle Newman that I can't wait to share with you talking about his amazing Dungeons & Dragons cookbook and, of course, the amazing world of Star Wars. So pull up a chair. Grab your favorite coffee mug, and let's have some coffee with Kenobi. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first? Joining us today for a cup of coffee. Well, see, I'm just going to stop myself. Normally, I give like the laundry list, and then I say the name, but I think we're going to do the reverse today, and we're just going to say, please welcome to the show for the first time, Mr. Kyle Newman. Kyle, of course, you know from Fanboys and you know a whole litany of incredible things. Obviously, one of the most knowledgeable Star Wars guys on the planet. Kyle, a pleasure to have you on Coffee with Kenobi. Oh, what a joy. Thanks for having me on. Finally, we, we, we meet over the web. That's right. That's right. We were just talking before. You uh, helped me with a Star Wars Insider article years ago about midichlorians and uh, been a huge admirer of yours for a long time. So it's great because we're going to get to talk about two of my favorite things, Star Wars and Dungeons and Dragons. You, of course, are one of the co-writers of Heroes Feast, the official D&D cookbook alongside John Peterson and Michael Whitwer, who was on last time when you guys had your incredible D&D book. Tell me kind of how Dungeons and Dragons fell into your path as a young man. Well, I was actually very young. I have some older brothers who at Boy Scout camp would play Dungeons and Dragons. And I was around, I'd visit them at summer camp and I'd go hang out in their tents and they were playing uh, an old TSR system. My brother actually, my brother Kevin turned some old rules into an Indiana Jones version of of the game. And they were homebrewing stuff, but I just love Dungeons and Dragons. But I never really got to play because I was too little. So I was like Elliot and E.T. I lingered near the older kids playing and didn't get my <laughs> shot. Um, but I learned all about the game, daydreamed about playing, flipped through the monster manual, obsessed over creatures. That's how I learned how to draw. It was that. It was Marvel Comics, and it was Dungeons and Dragons monster manuals, like just sketching creatures and monsters and fantasizing. And um, I eventually started playing. You know, I was a little bit older, maybe ten or eleven. Got into it more. I also at the same time was playing uh, West End Star Wars, which I loved. I also played GURPS Supers. I played Ninja Turtles by Palladium. Uh, but D and D always had a, a very special place in my heart, uh, as did obviously Star Wars. So. Role-playing games um, were just a big thing for me back when I was a a wee lad. It's good to meet someone who remembers the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. I had so many hours of fun with that when I was in high school. I guess we're probably around the same age. That was great, as was the Marvel one. And, of course, DC had a fun one as well. Can you hear me? There you are. You're back now. I okay. lost you for a second. Yeah, they got all weird. I don't know what happened. But anyway, okay. There you are. Okay. Perfect. You were talking about the Ninja Turtles game. Yeah. It's pretty cool to actually chat with someone who recognizes that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles role-playing game. I had so many hours of fun with that, along with the, the Marvel one. In fact, I found a copy of, when quarantine started, I found a copy of the Marvel TSR role-playing game Sealed, and I bought that in my seven-year-old, and I played that for a month. It was It was so great. There's something about role-playing that obviously makes storytelling beautiful, which lends into itself into your full-time gig, creating art, creating cinema, creating magic. What What is it about Dungeons & Dragons that always calls you back? It's a blank slate. It's this big world, just like Star Wars is, this expansive place you can go play, which is why so many people came into the Star Wars universe and wrote novels and did a role-playing game. Uh, George Lucas created this this believable, tangible universe that you could daydream about and then go explore. Same thing with Dungeons and Dragons. They've had wonderful creators over the years that have uh, taken multiple realms and explored them through novels and through modules. And 
it's set up for a dungeon master and for players to let their minds wander freely, to go unearth things that you wouldn't expect, to travel off the beaten path. And it's collaborative storytelling. You share the universe with your friends and the story evolves as you make it based on the dice and based on your your instincts and your choices. And there's something totally fun, hilarious, dramatic, unpredictable, exciting, and you make a family while you're doing it. So um, when I think of worlds in the communities too, like the Star Wars fandom, uh, it's like a family. Same thing with Dungeons and Dragons and the families you make when you play the game. And it's they're both very special, but they're at the core. Why I love them is about the connection that I have as a fan with the communities and with the people I play with. Beautifully said. It's like you're a writer or something. <laughs> <laughs> Try. Try. Hey, well, I, I'd say uh, I'd say you're doing really well, and that's very evident with the Heroes Feast, the official D and D cookbook. This is a very, very unique book. I mean, of course, it's Dungeons and Dragons, and we've come to expect gorgeous volumes with incredible art and prose, and this combines them with food. I mean, I'm going through this thing. Well, I don't want to give too much away, but talk to us kind of how this book is constructed and how it crossed your path. So we were finishing up Art Narcana and our publisher, um, Ten Speed Press. They do a lot of high-end, beautiful cookbooks, among other styles of books. And um, their foray into Dungeons and Dragons was Art Narcana, and they had a wonderful time doing it with us. And Aaron, who uh, publishes, he approached us and said, "Do you guys have any interest in a cookbook?" And at first, you know, we we're like what would that be? And we quickly wrapped our heads around it, that this was something exciting to explore because A, it had never been done. And B, we saw it as an opportunity to um, adventure into this space. We, like I said, didn't know exactly what it would be. And at first it, we considered, is this a geographical tour of the realms? Do we only focus in the realms? Are we also going to go to Kryn and Eberron and other places? Are we going to go to Earth, you know, Greyhawk. Um, how many settings could we go to? Did we have to put a limit on it? And then once you start opening up into settings, it was, well, elves, say, um, in Dragonlance are different than elves in um, Forgotten Realms. And just, just that alone, you, there's these different um, cultures within that that we suddenly felt like, you know, if we're going to do it, you have to touch on it. And then we started to organize it more in terms of cultures and, and um, traditions and styles of food. Uh, that would come about because of those cultural differences or ge geographical locations and less like a tour and more broken down into humans and dwarves and halflings and elves and then the more uncommon races. Uh, but we also get into, um, we have a section on beverages as well. So they're kind of isolated more at the back of the book, but even then it, it, it gives you a breadth of options, non-alcoholic, alcoholic. So within humans, you get to, um, move around the entire Sword Coast, but also to other places just within the Forgotten Realms. Then you get into humans on, on other planets and other realms. So it was a real research job to dive into 45 years of Dungeons & Dragons history, both within the game, both, um, as well as publications like Dragon, uh, also touching upon um, different modules, touching upon novels, um, video games, Food has been referenced and cataloged in many different ways. Uh, sometimes it's passing dialogue. Sometimes um, it's something within the game. Other times, you know, recipes have been published. Like there's these books from Dragonlance that um, um, the Leaves series, there's three of them. And they actually uh, were populated with a few recipes, each one. And there's a Forgotten Realms book by um, Greenwood, who um, it dives into... Um, culture as well as touches on some, you know, key ingredients and ratifying what would we really find e in each place regionally? What would uh, be available to say a, a person who lives in the underdark, which doesn't have sunlight and doesn't have livestock. And you're looking at things that are more mushroom based or, you know, freshwater fish. And so it, the palette and the options available are determined by a great many factors. And then we get into holidays and traditions. So 
it's very expansive. It's a deep dive. We do all this research and then we kind of curate it into a delectable, balanced menu. So you're touching on breads and salads and soups and breakfasts and as well as main courses. And it's organized the hero's feast. So you can plan a feast, a multi-course meal, touching on desserts as well. So a lot of thought went into this on how to organize it and plot it. And we do a lot of, we did a lot of uh, research to make sure we're mining every aspect we could, and then to curate it in the most exciting way for a reader and a, and a potential cook. So I guess there's a lot of ways we could go with this, but maybe the most important question is, do you have an opening for a best friend? Because I'd like to apply. <laughs> so <laughs> I love it because, you know, I'm an English teacher, I'm an educator. So I, I teach seniors. And we talk a lot oh, about wow. story and creativity and collaboration, which, of course, Dungeons and Dragons is all about. And when you're creating this, you have to do research, which, again, of course, I preach with my students all the time. And research is important because you have to know where to look. You have to know, you know, what kind of credibility you're dealing with. And obviously, you are dealing with credibility because of Dragon and all these authors and and places, you know, that you have mentioned for Dungeons and Dragons and as a side note, any book that gives you a recipe for black pudding, I mean, how great is that, really? Don't oh, typically okay. recommend eating it in the game, kids. But so you, when you come to the table and you, you explain beautifully sort of how the book works, because, because it is broken up into sections based on different races in Dungeons & Dragons. But the menus themselves, like of, of the three of you, I mean, Freddie didn't write this book. I'm sure Freddie is all over this thing. But... Who are you all sort of cooks for your families and things like that? Or, or was, how did you kind of make that happen? Well, we are, I, we all have a passion for food. I love cooking. Michael is a proficient cook. John is, since I've met John Peterson is, um, he's a foodie. He knows food. He sniffs out the best restaurant, and the best chef, no matter where you are in the world we've got to travel to a few places in the u.s for book tours and uh promotion and stuff and john always knows the best spot to eat and he just and he knows the best food so from the minute i met him he was all about food so it was great to collaborate with him in a capacity where we get to apply his great taste to this and michael actually went through after we uh had written the book and prepped all these recipes and he made all 80 recipes and in the book over uh, quarantine, wow. just to double check them all, just to test them, the salt levels, um, you know, the density, everything. So it's uh, everyone was all hands deck. Everyone was extremely passionate. Everyone cared about the food as much as they cared about the text and the lore. And I think that's why we all work so well together. Um, you know, John Peterson is an accomplished game historian maybe the most preeminent he has a book called playing at the world mm -hmm. which um if you're into the history of, of games especially role-playing games and especially war gaming stuff in the last i'd say the last 50 60 years um this is the book it's it is a master class in in it and it's probably the the single best book on the the subject out there and michael wrote an incredible biography um a very cinematic one about Gary Gygax called Empire of Imagination, which his brother, Sam Witwer, you know, Darth Maul, Star Killer, uh, also our co-author on Art and Arcana, narrates. And that's awesome too. So these guys are very bright and accomplished when it comes to the history within the space. So I learn something from them every every time we get on a phone call. And you know, we just combine to make something better together by how we approach it from our different uh, vocational abilities. We all have different day jobs and we do this as a, as a side project and as a passion. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it gives us a really healthy way of looking at it. Like we were able to approach that art and arcana in that way. We all could vet what was going to end up in the book and we all commented on why it should or shouldn't be in it and could look at things in unique ways that hadn't been spoken of before that were both personal and analytical and same thing with this. We really went down the list in terms of uh, what we were going to profile, what cultures, how we were going to do that, and what food was going to be represented. Same type of approach. And it's always an effortless 
uh, process that elevates the final book. Absolutely. And as you're creating this and creating these recipes and sort of going through your experiences as a cook yourself, did you find yourself creating recipes to particular characters that you have played over the years? Like I'm playing a paladin right now that's eighth level, and I, I can't help but think, what would he eat? What would my character eat, uh, depending on where he was? What would be his preference? Did that kind of funnel your direction at all? Character, not specific character, a little bit, because I would daydream about my character. Like the fantasy of D&D is you love that when you go in and you have to, like, you get that rest and you finally make it to the end and it's dangerous possibly, but you navigate whatever you need to do and you have that, you settle down for that long rest and you hear about what's on, what's on the menu at the tavern. That factors into it a little bit, you know. Um, I have a half-orc barbarian that I play in Joe Manganiello's Death Saves game. Um, we play that with, with the big show from WWE and Vince Vaughn and Tom Rello from Rage Against the Machine and the and Dan Weiss, who created Game of Thrones, it's a super group. Wow. And uh, I play this barbarian. And it's one of my favorite characters. And um, I worked him into the lore. So his name is Kalatur Minmax. Um, and he's from the Minmax <laughs> tribe of half orcs, which are, which are in uh, the Forgotten Realms up in the north. And so it was good to just work that character. And I was trying to work some of my other characters into the text, but that one felt applicable and it and applies to one of the recipes in the, the book, which you'll see. Um, and, um, but I didn't write anything. I guess maybe that's the one I wrote specifically for that mm-hmm. character, but in general, it's more me. It's more who, what would me like the fan or the person um, I would love to daydream and drift off to this place and wander into these you know, the green dragon in or the wa- or, or, you know, like um, down in water deep and, um, you know, just, just drift between these establishments. And I mean, it, it's pretty magical and it's nice to let your mind wander in terms of what could be explored and to bring that to life. And we have these menus too, that are um, representative of, four key four key taverns i would say that anchor some of these the the planets we discuss and they're cool like you could probably scan them and print them out and present them to your players yes so it's fun to like analyze what a menu would be what the price points are research how how food was priced what era we're in and old books how they price things and uh, come up with a system as to what drinks would cost versus extra bread you know yes well, Dungeons and Dragons fans are going to literally and figuratively eat this up because of everything that you just described. I mean, and what I like is I'm looking through this. We have a monthly teacher group that plays Dungeons and Dragons. We have an English teacher, a librarian, two math teachers, and a history teacher, and then a designer who's not an educator, but just we're friends with him. So we all bring different sort of things to the table and different culinary levels of, of skill, but we all like to eat, right? So when you're creating this book, or, and now when the book is going to be out into the world, how do you envision it being used for not only Dungeons & Dragons campaigns, but just for people who enjoy good meals? Well, I I wanted the book to be something that, it, whether you're not using it on a game night or a night when you're alone, um, there's something in it for everyone. There's something in it for all different levels of cooks. Um all different holidays. There's stuff, you know, coming up for Halloween. There's stuff that's applicable to Thanksgiving and Christmas. And if you're building menus that way, it's and plotting for relatives to come over. It's fun in that way. It's fun for game night. If you want to say, you know, this, this adventure has got a, we're wandering into the forest and we're encountering these wood elves. And then you want to task people in your group to bring the salads and stuff together to make it like what would be a, a feast applicable to that. Um, it inspires you to go do those things. It un- unleashes you to do that, to add an extra level of immersion to your game. So you're invariably going to eat food no matter what. You're playing for four, six hours. You got to eat. You got to snack. Why not try one of these snacks that's germane to the universe you're playing in? So that's the philosophy. So I, I think, and whether or not you're in an active campaign, if you just love fantasy, if you love cooking, it still excites the imagination to flip through and see some of these recipes. They're just familiar but a little left of center plus some things that are just out of 
left field. And we, we try to present, um, you know, not just European style tavern fare from a couple hundred years ago, but it's a very diverse and eclectic balanced menu loaded with options. So, um, it's also great for flip through. If you just want to look at fantastic pictures and see Dungeons and Dragons visualized, you know, for the first time in photos, really, Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some cool prop Easter eggs built into it. Um, that are, are cool little things that help immerse you in the world. And we've also got, you know, just there's, it's loaded with great lore and stories. So if you're playing an elf and you want to read about the traditions and holidays and, um, dining etiquette, things like that of an elf, it's all in there. Or if you want to you know, get into a region, you know, sometimes we deep dive into certain areas. So it's got a little bit, um, a little bit for everyone. And I think if, like, if you are in it for the, for the text and the lore, it, it definitely um, satisfies on that level as well. I also feel like when you're creating characters or if you already have an established character that you want to make more nuanced, there's some great stuff here. For instance, in the way that the book is is laid out, and we've sort of alluded to this previously, but there are different sections based on different um, races, and then there's there's a brief sort of a narrative about like humans or elves and sort of their culture, as you mentioned, in and their appreciation for food and their preferences, their dislikes, and then you know, for example, in the humans one, you've got a, a great quote from Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman who you know, were so instrumental to me in high school and a little bit in early college because of their wonderful Dragonlance books and everything else that they did to craft this lore that we love so much. But then every single recipe has a brief sort of storytelling slash element of verisimilitude that helps to sort of say, hey, this is why Traveler's Stew is going to be relevant to your game or to your to your game night or to just a meal you want to have at home with your loved ones. And I think that's brilliant. I can't think of any other cookbook that is really sort of laid out like this, that it's story, it's art and it's food. And I think it's amazing. Oh, thanks. I'm glad it, it was something. It was like, same thing with our Arnacana. It was, there was a gap. There was something missing. And as a fan, I looked for that book when I got back into Dungeons and Dragons in mm-hmm. 2015 heavily. Uh, I was like, where's the book that kind of encapsulates what I've missed. Where's the book on, on the art? What's, what's out there? I wanted to go buy it on Amazon. It didn't exist. And I was like, well, I'm going to go make this book. And I reached out to Michael Whitware and the team was formed. Um, but it was because there was a desire to see a book that I wanted as a fan. And that's what this book is too. Uh, when it was presented to us, uh, the challenge to bring it to life, I immediately felt like I wanted that book on my shelf. And I love those old books. I love the old Volos guides that used to tour around Waterdeep and Baldur's Gate and um, Cormier. You know, I read all those books and it, he would rate the the inns and dissect their menus and talk about standout dishes. And I thought that was so fun that he was like, um, you know, in hindsight now you look at it, it's like he's like an Anthony Bourdain of the of the realms in Volo. Yes. And I was inspired by those books. And I think we we researched every single piece of material like that when we were uh, aggregating our ideas and building this out because that stuff's foundational to um, D and D lore. So um, it's, it's like one of those things where you want to make the book that you as a fan want on your shelf Mm -hmm. and you're just lucky enough to be a part of the process of making it. Now the book exists and I actually got to contribute to with an awesome team to make it. Um, now it's there as a fan, you know, I flipped, I got the book, the hardcover a couple of weeks ago for the first time and got to hold it in my hands. And it's such a great achievement, but just as a fan, I'm like, I love this book. This is awesome. You know, uh, that's a great feeling, you know, to have it come out so, so well. And, to ha- feel like you've helped fill a void for other fans. It, it is an absolutely wonderful feeling to get that book in your hands for the first time. And you get to see your work and kind of revisit it as a reader, as opposed to a writer, but then you get to experience what your collaborators did as well. And then you've thrown the art thrown in there. Did you have any sort of uh, say in the art or were you just sort of pleasantly surprised along with the rest of us when you got to pour through it? Um, I was 
watching the art. We conceived of the art. We wanted the art to um, convey different aspects of what goes into food. It's, it, there's hunting and gathering. There's the harvest. There's uh, the cooking process. There's the feasting. There's the traditions that go with it. There's the revelry afterwards, um, the camaraderie, the team stuff. All of that we tried to depict in these uh, anchoring images for each chapter. And watching the art come in was was a joy because we just had just so many beautiful pieces that just, um, you know, opened the book up. We had a lot of detailed photography of food, and we wanted these images uh, that, um, you know, kick off each chapter to – open your mind up to the expanse of the world and bring that to life artistically, visually, um, and then deep dive into the photos of the food. So it was cool. It was a great process. Yeah, I, I absolutely think, whether you're a Dungeons & Dragons fan or not, you have, if you like fantasy in any way, shape, or form, you're going to love this because the art is absolutely gorgeous. I'm hungry looking at this, and I've already had dinner, but it looks great. Do you have a specific uh, meal Let's go with a meal and a dessert that you think, gosh, I'd like to have this right now. You open up the book, go through the recipe, boom, ready, let's have some dinner. Um, you know, there's a – I'm craving um, – there's some stuffed French toast in there. It's a halfling recipe with mm-hmm. a marmalade syrup. It's great. I would go – I could go for a bouillabaisse. Like right now, I'd love to get like a seafood bouillabaisse or – there's a, a Moonshe seafood risotto rice, which is great. I'm craving some seafood right now. I do love, um, there's a great turkey and stuffing recipe for starting to feel the, the effects of fall. I'd love to dine on that. There's so, and there's so many great desserts. There's one called Meals End. It's an elven dessert. And it's kind of a variation on eat and mess, like a, a British dessert. It involves meringue. And this one's sprinkled with, a, with like a fresh berries and a dark chocolate meringue. There's a lot of cool stuff. There's too many cool things. There's uh, something, um, it's like a cocoa broth, which is kind of like a variation on a hot chocolate. Mm. I could drink that right now. <laughs> you remind me of Italian I don't drink hot alcohol, chocolate. So I don't, yeah. I didn't try any of the alcoholic drinks. You know, I helped conceive of them, but I'm not, I'm not into the, the, those libations. So I'm more into the mulled ciders and the, the teas and the, the cocos. The fall, the fall thing is rather apt. I mean, of course, the book is coming out in the fall, so that makes sense. But that I love that. That's just that's just really, really fun. I'm looking forward. The French toast did look great, as I mentioned earlier. The black pudding, I think, is fascinating. And then in the in the human section, I can't remember the name now, but it looks like there's cinnamon rolls, but I don't see cinnamon in the recipe. But the way they look, let me see if I can find it again. Oh, those ones. I think um, I believe those are from. Uh... Is that an Eberron thing? I think that's a uh, their mushroom. Oh yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. And I don't do mushrooms. Yeah, it's called Ved bread. Ved bread. Yes, it's, it's from Eberron. Um, it's an iteration of a famous uh, Eberron bread. And I'm not a mushroom fan. I'll I'll divulge divulge that. <laughs> I avoid them. And uh, but I do understand the the people love them. And it was still cool to brainstorm about dishes using them so i've not tried the bed bread but everyone that has tried it does like it <laughs> i'm gonna try to make it i'm very much an amateur chef but i mean black pepper parmesan cheese unsalted butter but you'll see it's like it's like a savory cinnamon roll yeah in a way you know so it's you're replacing the cinnamon with this um it's like a mushroom spread i love it i love it let's go ahead and take a quick break and then kyle and i will return and talk about that galaxy far far away this is coffee with kenobi This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. MEI and Mouse Fan Travel is your one-stop shop for your vacation needs and your plans to Walt Disney World, Disneyland, or the cruise lines. Travel looks much different now than it did a couple of months ago, and with the opening of Walt Disney World and soon, hopefully, the opening of Disneyland, You need a place to go where you can trust and they will help you figure out and navigate all the different circumstances and guidelines that Disney has put out for you. And I can say that we had our vacation modified and as soon as dates were announced, MEI contacted me directly 
to help me reschedule, which is exactly what I was hoping to do. So if you are interested in rescheduling your vacation or want to try to plan a Walt Disney World, Disneyland vacation, or anywhere else you want to go on the planet, be sure to contact MEI and Mouse Fan Travel at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel. Their signature service and expert advice will help you maximize your vacation time and dollar, and they will help you figure out all the different changes and modifications going on at the Disney theme parks. They are amazing, and I can tell you, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, the peace of mind that Becky Mencken and the crew at MEI and Mouse Fan Travel have given me is invaluable. If you're interested at all, again, go to www. That coffee with Kenobi.com slash mouse fan travel. So, I mean, of course, we got to transition to Star Wars because I can't have you on the show, Coffee with Kenobi, not talk about Star Wars. But uh, I had a couple of people who I, I talked to who were huge Dungeons and Dragons f- fans, including my good friend Tom, who wanted me to ask you do you have a particular favorite class or race that you like to play as a character? Well, company that makes it's called wizards of the coast not sorcerers of the coast (laughs) not warlocks of the coast (laughs) wizard i love wizards um wizards give you uh they're 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 a challenge uh you really have to spend the time to research and theme out your wizard there's so many spells to pick from and how to shape your identity and how you go about casting and seeing magic and learning magic um the simplicity of like say the barbarian i'm playing it's a zealot barbarian um, I don't multi-class very frequently. I'm not, I'm not as into the multi-class, but I, I like playing that. There's, there's a beautiful simplicity to it, but the wizard is a challenge because you have to research recipes. Oh, I don't have recipes. Here I go. Uh, <laughs> spells. And we did look at spells a lot like recipes because there's components and, sure. and elements. So there's a lot of that uh, talk back and forth. There's a lot of, uh, you know, synonymous terminology and uh, applicable ways of looking at it. And, um, I love playing wizards. I mean, I love, I'm playing a, a paladin right now, an Azamar, a female Azamar paladin, hmm. who's a conquest paladin, uh, playing Avernus. I love that character. I, I played, um, this, uh, elf, Aether, Hollow Glow, who was a ranger. Uh, but that one I did multi-class into, um, rogue and a little bit of fighter. And we did uh, two of Annihilation. That was a really fun Gloomstalker Ranger. Did you survive? Um, That's a tough one. We survived. Wow. Uh, and I'm playing a War Mage right now in Mad Mage. Uh, we're down on level 16 of um, Undermountain. Um, and I love clerics. I think clerics are such a great class. Mm-hmm. And it was this trend. Everyone thinks you have to. Everyone has to play bards. But I mean, the cleric is so so awesome. Um, and there's versatility with a cleric too. Yeah, I love druids. Um, I just let's say I haven't been drawn to. I haven't played you know warlocks, sorcerers, bards. You know, I think they're all cool. I'm going to get to them. There's only so much time in in the in the day. You know, uh, I'll try them all out. Um, monk, I haven't tried in this edition, um, but. Um, I'm trying to give everything a go. I'll get around to it all, but I do love wizards. Sure. No, I, that's, a wizard is something I've never played, but I've been talking about it for a while. Right now I've got, as I said, I've got a eighth-level paladin. He's an Oath of Vengeance paladin. He's, he's oh, pretty cool. fun. Yeah, you got any tips for me? <laughs> yeah, I'm, you know, this one, the paladin I've been playing, it's been a little stop and start because of, um, you know, I was on the West Coast and going through a lot of personal things this year, and it just made it hard to, st- to be always present in the, in the campaign with this character and then you're playing virtually and it's this, it's just a little different when everything's done on, you know, roll 20 and yes. over discord or zoom. So I, f- I felt a little dissociated from the experience playing the paladin, but I really like the character, but we're nearing the end of it. So mm-hmm. I, d- I do think it's a fun class. I didn't get to master the paladin. You know, I, I, um, I feel like I need to play it again to really get the full experience. I could. We use Roll Twenty for a while, and I agree. There's very much a disconnect. I think there's something about I mean, the camaraderie that comes with playing Dungeons and Dragons with your friends. My wife refers to it as nerd poker, and I'll take that. I will take that. It is nerd poker. It's yeah. it replaces nerd. poker night, and there's something so much more interesting about it. Yes. Forgive me if you play poker. I do out not. There, people. But <laughs> I like it's it's fun. It's, it's cool. But I couldn't imagine doing that every week. This mm-hmm. is like. 
imagine substituting something in, at least from my perspective, that has that changes every week and there's just more story and depth to it. And you can still do all the same camaraderie and hangout, but it's different every week, you know, and I, it, there's the thrill of poker and, and I guess the game of it. And that's cool. But we also, within our games, the, the game we play with Joe and his death saves war, the dragon campaign, we had whole sessions for four hours where we're in water deep at the yawning, at the yawning portal. Yes. And um, we're gambling playing like high low and people are going nuts like betting and winning tens of thousands of dollars for our characters and people are so into it it's hilarious and it's it's not real but because you're doing it together it's amazing and then you can still go off an adventure and and kill bad guys you know so it's um you get a little bit of everything with D D. that's why i love it that's right it's 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 a great way to actually exercise your creative mind and collaborate and and come up with things that it's never, ever the same. It's never the same. We were talking about paladins, and I feel like a paladin may be the closest thing to a Jedi, perhaps, in the world of Dungeons & Dragons. Yeah. So so let's talk some Star Wars. I know, uh, of course, from hearing you for years on Rebel Force Radio and the Force cast, uh, your, your intense love and passion. In fact, the last time I had Steve on, Steve Sansweet, I was at, we were talking about The Empire Strikes Back, and he said, well, Dan, I'm not Kyle Newman, so I can't really go as deeply as he would. So there you go. There's a, there's a feather. Wait, who said that one? Steve Sansweet. Oh, Steve's the best. He is. My God, he's like a he's he's like a a publishing idol to me because he's done so many cool books. Yes, and he has curated this incredible foundation and museum, and I love that guy. I met him years and years ago before I was putting together, uh, fanboys. Sure, and he's such a great guy. Such a compassionate, helpful human fellow fan i mean i i just joy every time i get to run into steve sadly it's been a bit since uh, i missed the last celebration it's like the first one i missed uh since celebration one and um and you know this year just with covid and and travel and stuff some i always like to go up up the coast and pop in and see steve at his at his rancho obi-wan yes uh magical place it is <laughs> um, he's a it's been a bit guy. though Yep. It, well, I, I'm sure he'll be happy to see you when, when the time comes around again. But I, I know, of course, how you feel about the prequels and in the, in the OT. But uh, when people tell me that Star Wars fans are toxic, I don't subscribe to that because I don't cultivate that. I cultivate a place where we've got a lot of different opinions and a lot of different theories and ideas about things. But at the end of the day, we love this mythology that George Lucas created for us. So where where do kind of you stand on uh, the sequel trilogy, and what sort of moved you about how it affected the story? A loaded question, I grant you. You're talking about the, where we're at right now with fandom, or I uh, just general? just not necessarily fandom because that's just sort of a whatever, but just like the story itself. The how did it, how did the, the mythology move you with the creation of the sequel trilogy? You know, the sequel trilogy, I have an interesting relationship with it. I love the fact that there are more Star Wars movies. Um, I am a filmmaker and a storyteller. I would have done certain things differently. Um, I appreciate all of the hard work that goes into making a Star Wars movie. It's the, it's probably the hardest job in film because it's the most scrutinized. Yes. Um, I think J.J. is just an incredible craftsman, idea man, and a writer. He shoots really well, and he casts incredible. That cast he put together is brilliant. And um, I'm excited by, you know, whenever I see his stuff, there's always something fresh and exciting and uh, alive and electric and organic about what he does. And um, I felt like he i liked i really liked rise of skywalker i liked the way it ended i I liked the way it had a lot of big ideas introduced i liked the way it took some bold swings i liked the fact that um it felt like old pulpy you know uh sci-fi fantasy cliffhangers you know like just the way it opened with the dead speak it just was kind of bold uh felt like something george would do um I think there were some missteps in the middle and there's stuff I love about last Jedi and there's, there's stuff I don't. Um, so 
but they're all they're all Star Wars movies, and I love Star Wars. So, um, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I love this fandom. I love all the movies. I can pop on any of the movies and get something out of them and really enjoy them. Um, it's great experiencing them again with my children. You know, I have a now seven year old and five year old, and they're obsessed with Star Wars Lego, and they're obsessed with we just marathoned Rebels um, since they were like little. They just wanted to watch the original trilogy over and over again. And they had access to everything, and they just wanted that over and over. They love um, Empire and Jedi especially. And um, I think that speaks volumes. There's a testament to that. There's something magical, alchemical that happened in those movies. And I think, you know, both the prequels and the sequel trilogy were trying to recapture some of that magic. And I guess my biggest gripe with it all even the prequels is rather than recapturing magic you know why not make new magic yes and that's what i'd like to see be reintroduced into star wars rather than just references and recycling and um homages and i think it's great to have those things and be reverential i think it's great to if you're gonna and if you're gonna subvert subvert with purpose not just for the sake of doing it um but I think there's so many fresh stories to tell that don't even have to be in this section of the timeline. I think you could jump so much farther forward, so much further backward and not even need the connective tissue that people think you need um, to tether it all together uh, because the world is so unique. Someone we we're talking, I was talking with some different people about star Wars and I'm like, well, it's, it's this type of genre. I'm like, no, it's not. Star Wars is its own genre. There's nothing like it. There's never been anything like it. And it's its own genre. And rather than saying, I want to make a war film out of Star Wars, or I'm going to go to, look, newsflash, Star Wars is a war film. It's called Star Wars. It opens in a battle. Like, <laughs> I, you know, it doesn't take, you don't need a big conceit to, to rethink Star Wars. Study it, understand it, love it, then jump in and tell the story. It's not that hard. Um, I think people over-elaborate because maybe they don't get it. Maybe they don't love it. Um, maybe, I, I mean, that's why I think it would come easy to me to work in Star Wars. It would be a dream thing for me to do. It'd be something I would just relish. I was born and bred and forged to work on Star Wars. <laughs> One day I will. Um, so life goals, you know, but, uh, I, I understand it. I study it. I get how it works. Um, and I think in order to make something fresh and new, it has to become second nature. You can't be trying to uh, indicate to people that you know Star Wars. You can't be trying to communicate um, and show off. You just go tell the great story and you understand those inherent qualities that make something Star Wars. Uh, and it is alchemical. And you have to understand that alchemical recipe that's going to bring that to life. And I think people just think, well, if I do a lightsaber and I have this music here, it's this. And it's not. Um, There's a soul to it. That, that and a tone. Been, yes. Yeah. Yes. That's beyond lore. Mm -hmm. It's beyond uh, timeline. It's beyond canon. Uh, it beyond is lightsabers. It's a spiritual core. It's a sense of humor. Um, and it is an amalgamation of lots of different genres. And Star Wars has become its own genre. And it needs to partake in that fully. I, I want to see Star Wars get back to the place where it was, where it was the innovator. When you saw a Star Wars movie, it was... It not only broke new ground narratively and was fresh, uh, but it also changed the way films were made. And as good as the sequel films are, they just were blockbusters that came out. They didn't change the barometer. They didn't change the level of filmmaking. They didn't break down barriers and uh, re-establish uh, a new gold standard. But they worked. So... Um, I'm, I think it's great. I think, look, everywhere I look, no matter where I look, things are toxic. It's hard. So I wouldn't say it's Star Wars fandom that's toxic. There's just people online that are toxic. Agreed. And that has to overlap with anything that's giant and pervasive and, you know, that, that permeates all culture. And Star Wars is as big as it gets. And um, so you're going to find all types of people in that. It's, a, it's you know, like the cantina. So you're going to find the good, the bad, and, and the ugly in there. And you just <laughs> got to take it and love it, you know? it's. But that's with any big fandom. 
um, and any big, you know, it's with sports culture. It's with anything. So I don't I wouldn't vilify Star Wars fans or its fan base and say that it's just, um, it's just where it is. And now with with the internet and the way people talk and communicate and share and and gatekeep and shame, you know, it's just it's just par for the course. But I wouldn't condemn fandom as a whole. And anyway, I think it's vibrant and strong and uh, still inspiring. And it's what makes me happy about Star Wars is the community. I think this, the community is wonderful and the community has been nothing but wonderful to me for the entire seven plus years of, of the show and just everything that's happened. I mean, because to me at the end of the day, critical thinking and intellectual honesty are what help to percolate conversation and to create this wonderful discourse that we have as fans and as friends. And you know, as well as I do that your friends through star Wars or dungeons and dragons or what have you, become like family to you because it's just a it's a ripe minefield for a lot of great big ideas that that speak to us on a very primal level and I absolutely love the last 10 minutes I could just sit there and eat popcorn and listen to you say that over and over again because it was very beautifully said so thank you for that yeah thank you I mean I'm excited about your book coming out I'm excited by you know your, your show's been going on forever. It's great to finally come on and, and talk to you in this capacity. And I don't know. I think there's and there. There's Star Wars seems like it's in a little bit of a lull, probably till just till Mandalorian comes out. And then we're going to get, you know, more movies and it's going to come back again, roaring stronger than ever. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just glad there is more Star Wars. There was some dark days where we're like, we're never going to get any more. And then we got the prequels and then we're like, we're never going to get any more. And then we got the sequels and they're over, and now we don't even know what we're going to get. So um, I'm excited. I'm always going to show up opening night twice. <laughs> you know, the 7 p.m. showing and the midnight showing yes. and beyond. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a fanatic, so. Well said, as always. Let's take one more quick break and return with some more from Kyle Newman. This is Coffee with Kenobi. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is... <laughs> That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a cup of coffee with me and for helping to spread the word about our Star Wars family we've got here at Coffee with Kenobi. Be sure to tune in Monday nights at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash live or www.facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi and have a cup of coffee, tea, or any beverage of your choosing with me as we continue the conversation. To join us in the CWK Cafe, which is our Facebook group, and share your Star Wars thoughts, comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly, spoiler-free place that is also drama-free, go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash community and be part of the conversation, talk about this week's show, or just talk about some Star Wars. It is a lot of fun and you'll make some new friends as well as catch up with longtime friends along the way. I also want to thank all of the new and longtime members of the CWK Alliance and let you know how much I appreciate your help and encouragement. A big thank you to our CWK Alliance members, Mary Perdue, Jason Hall, Dennis Keithley, Ross Holliban, Cato McNichol, Alexander Moylan, Jim Capron, Smooth Rivera, Tyler Pompa, Frank Mulder, Colby Mead, LJ Souter, Daz Davies, Dustin Mills, Robert Avila, Terry King, Jeff Ellis, David Nicely, Chris Gavarka, Angela Sauce, Aaron Harris, Greg McLaughlin, Eric Struthers, Christine Turk, Brian McKinney, Alex Procasio, Hannah, Susan Gray, Ian Thompson, Dan Ream, Christian Dale, J.C. Poe, Ed Kimoto, Blake Weaver, Chelsea Sansbury, Yancey Evans, Craig Hargrove, Chris Metz, Connie Shee, Mark Suter, Jared Cantor, Kurt McKellen, Thea Selby, and Simbot Defterdarian. If you want to join the CWK Alliance, be sure to go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash CWK Alliance and sign up today. Not only will you help out Coffee with Kenobi, but you also get access to CWK Pour Over, the exclusive weekly podcast not heard anywhere else. It's a great way to support and help out the show, and 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to support the incredibly important work they are doing to help these brave children and their families. Plus, 
contributors at the CWK All-Star level can watch a video podcast of CWK Pour Over, hosted by me, Tom Gross, and Corey Club. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. In addition to being part of the community on Facebook, please don't forget to visit our website at www.coffeewithkenobi.com for Star Wars news, announcements, reviews, live video, and so much more. If you have a question for me or just want to share your thoughts on the air, please feel free to reach out to me at danz at coffeewithkenobi.com and I'll share them on the show. You can also connect with me on Twitter at Mr. Zer, M-R-Z-E-H-R. There are also a lot of ways to connect with me and Coffee with Kenobi on social media. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Give us a like on Facebook at facebook.com slash coffee with Kenobi and check us out on Pinterest. You can find me twice a month on the podcast looking at Lucasfilm, part of the Jim Hill Media Podcast Network, and you can find my writing on CWK's website as well as starwars.com where I'm an official blogger there as well as on IGN where I contribute articles on Star Wars as well as other popular culture topics. And if you're considering starting a podcast or a blog, let me know how I can help you get started and help you make your creative vision a reality. Be sure to check out danzymedia.com where we can get the process started. I'm also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. You can take that first step into a larger world. Thanks, as always, to our CWK sponsors, especially MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, our travel partner, and your one-stop shop for all things Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or anywhere on the planet. Please go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel to book your magical vacation and help support Coffee with Kenobi in the process. And don't forget to pre-order my brand new book that I wrote alongside Pablo Hidalgo and Cole Horton, the Star Wars book published by DK. Be sure to pre-order your copy of the Star Wars book today. I can't wait to share it with each and every one of you. If you like the show, please tweet out that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your friends and family to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. And if the Force is especially with you, please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes or Google Podcasts. Every review makes a huge difference and helps to spread the word. Go to iTunes and search Coffee with Kenobi and you'll see the show there. My circle of friends has grown so much because of this podcast and each and every one of you, and it means so much to me that we have such a wonderful Star Wars community. Thank you all so much for all you do. In the meantime, until we get our next Star Wars movie, be sure to go out and get Dungeons & Dragons Heroes Feast, the official D&D cookbook written by... Kyle Newman, John Peterson, and Michael Whitworth. Kyle, where can people continue the conversation with you if they want to ask you a question or just say hello? And and let us know what kind of stuff you have coming down the pipe. Oh, I'm on. You can find me on. I have a Facebook fan page, Kyle Newman. I'm on Instagram, Kyle underscore Newman. I'm on Instagram, Kyle underscore Newman. Um, I'm always posting stuff about Star Wars, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I am a. I am a nerd. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and I love all this stuff. So I'm always happy to engage and talk and you can definitely find me there. And, um, you know, Heroes Feast is coming out. Uh, or it's out October 27th. Uh, you can find it everywhere. We have a Barnes & Noble special edition with this great uh, Jared Blando fold-out map of the Forgotten Realms Sword Coast. Uh, we've got the regular edition. And you mentioned earlier we had Art and Arcana, which was the definitive history of visual history of Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, that's out there in the wild. Um, and I've got a new film that I'm uh, prepping right now that's shooting in mid-November. I'm up here in Toronto getting it ready. And it's in the world of esports and gaming. It's a new comedy. Cannot wait. Well, <laughs> Kyle, again, thank you so much for being a guest on Coffee with Kenobi. Best of luck to you, and we look forward to having you on in the future. Thank you. Thanks so much. Happy holidays. Hopefully I'm back again soon. That would be awesome, Kyle. You're welcome anytime. And I want to thank everybody so much for joining me for a bonus episode of Coffee with Kenobi. Of course, whenever you get a chance to Kyle Newman, you got to take advantage of it because he's such a great guy and such a huge, knowledgeable Star Wars fan. His passion is exciting and inspiring as is spending so much time with each and every one of you on Coffee with Kenobi. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me twice this week. Be sure to join us again next Monday night at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time for Facebook Live. Until then... This is the podcast you're looking for. 
This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. 